now you have your decoration slide. Um, if you wouldn't mind each introducing yourself and your official titles, and then uh, maybe you can talk about what your uh, day in the life as a so soil scientist actually entails. Okay. Well, uh, so my name is Vince Archer. I work at the Region 1 office. So in government, there's always bureaucracy. So you have smaller units, like uh, we call them districts, and they're, um, they're kind of the basic unit level of a force. And those are um, uh, tens to hundreds of thousands of acres of coverage. And then that goes up to a national forest level. And then you have us uh, true bureaucrats who are at the regional level. So Andy and I cover Region 1, and that entails uh, all of Montana, northern Idaho, and, and bits of the Dakotas uh, in the grasslands over there. So I'm a soil scientist. Andy? Uh, yeah, so Andy Efta, uh, like Natalie said, our regional hydrologist, so Vince's counterpart. Um, here in the in the northern region, and um, and maybe I'll add a little more on to the structure uh, or the, the hierarchy, the nested hierarchy of the the agency. So, you know, we have um, b above then the regional offices. We then in turn have have wa the Washington office, which is um, in turn sitting under the umbrella of the, you know, uh, the U.S. Department of Agriculture, which seems a little counterintuitive, I think, for a lot of folks when it comes to land management agencies. Um, and uh, that that's a long history uh, around personality conflicts and political maneuvering that, you know, uh, ultimately resulted in the Forest Service City and the Department of Agriculture. So um, I think that's that's about it organizationally. Um, maybe we'll just keep tag teaming this. Sure. You asked about academic um, background um, and professional background, I suppose, too. Um, so I'm a, I'm a University of Montana grad, actually a two-time University of Montana grad. Uh, my degrees are actually from over in the College of Forestry, just across the street, um, and uh, both of those in resource conservation. Um, the way that the, the, uh, the College of Forestry degrees are set up are, um, they're, they're designed to provide some flexibility, at least especially on the resource conservation front. So, um, so my background was, was basically in just the physical sciences track with, with my uh, bachelor's degree, master's degree. Um, Again, physical sciences, however, ended up diving more over into the, uh, the geosciences realm um, for a fair portion of the work I did. I actually worked with Andrew Wilcox here in the Department of Geosciences. Um, and uh, so ultimately coming out of that master's degree, I, I, um, uh, my, if, if you had to try and put, I guess, a, a silo on my, my areas of specific technical expertise, it would be sediment transport processes, uh, watershed hydrology, and fluvial geomorphology and, and modeling of, of those things. So um, let's see, professional background wise past that, um, I, uh, I've worked for the, for the Forest Service actually my entire professional uh, working career. I started out directly out of graduate school. I went out um, uh, and worked in the Upper Peninsula of Michigan for a couple of years on the Hiawatha National Forest. Um, was came back over to Montana and worked for a couple of more national forests here in uh, in the northern region again prior to joining my partner in crime here in the regional office so um, I'll let you go sure so I um, I actually got my undergrad um, through a couple of mechanisms so I was in California so I went junior college because I had no idea what I wanted to do or be and then from junior college, and actually, Natalie taught at the same junior college I attended. It was much cheaper back in those days. Uh, it was $150 a semester. <laughs> California subsidized that. I know, that's shocking. But uh, anyways, uh, so I did two years that, and I, I got a basic foundation in sciences. I wanted to be an engineer, but I wasn't bright enough. So I <laughs> so from there, I went to Chico State, which is a CSU, um, so a California state in institution. And so there, I, I took way too many credits and myriad of things. I picked up a couple of minors, one in stats and one in biology. But it was, it was, I wanted to work outside, and I was interested in science. So it was a physical science, environmental science kind of capture. So from there, immediately I got a job in uh, road construction shoveling asphalt. I couldn't get any work anywhere. And um, you know, you mentioned, Natalie, about internships. 
And so this is circa the 1990s, but internships were really hard to come by. And so um, one of the biggest things for me was they wanted you to volunteer. So I was like, well, how, 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 where am I supposed to live? And, and so, so that was actually an impediment for me. So I finally did get a job with the Nature Conservancy, and I was chasing plants all around, and so that was great. And that led to uh, going over to New Mexico, and I worked um, with a university affiliate there, and I chased plants and all over the state there. And that was fantastic. Uh, one thing I, that I didn't understand is, is like, why were certain plants in one place versus another? So when you look at the landscape, you'll see this kind of trajectory of, of uh, different life forms as you go up from the grasslands onto the tip tops of the mountains. And so I wanted to better understand what was behind these distributions. I also, so I knew I needed to go to grad school, but I didn't know exactly what that would be. Uh, a buddy of mine I worked with um, had just come from Montana, said the skiing was great, and so I liked that. And then the major professor that I was going to work with was also a skier, biker, runner, and so we hit it off great. A uh, fellow by the name of Tom DeLuca, who happened to be your dean not too long ago for at least forestry. Uh, so anyways, that's kind of what led me into soils. And so I studied soils here. It was more an ecological degree, but it was resource con. And I really liked this graduate school because with resource con, it was taking that generalist perspective. So I kind of had an, an interest in too many different things, but it still, it, it allowed me to chase some of those passions. Um, coming out of that, uh, a friend of mine turned me on to what at that time was a sketch. And so that was an internship kind of entry level position for the Forest Service. I had always kind of wanted to work in the Forest Service. I had done a couple of temporary uh, jobs over the summers for the Forest Service back in the early 90s when I was going to undergrad. And so that was, that gave me a flavor. And so that was essentially how I got in in around 2000. And the funny thing is, is when you start a career you may not think you're going to stay there, but as time goes on, you, you do. And so just like Andy, it's like you hop from one position or forest to another, different parts of the country, and I ended up at the regional office um, later in the game. Yeah. So as a tag team duo, you hydrologists and soil scientists work together a lot. What kind of projects do you do, and what does your work in those projects um, involve? What is your day-to-day -day work like? It's not this, I'm sure. You want me? I, I can start, sure. Yeah, so, so we'll talk a little, I mean, so like Vince said, we, and we, we joke really that we're bureaucrats, right? I mean, we'll, and it's only partially joking. Um, <laughs> but, uh, you know, maybe I'll speak to kind of the role of a hydrologist or a soil scientist that you would think of, like, say, working on a national forest, and, and then we can spool up to, to what our roles look like. So um, for, for a hydrologist or soil scientist that's sitting on a ranger district or a national forest, like Vince was talking about structure-wise for the agency, um, you know, those folks are um, employed, or us, we are employed, you know, in, in large part around ensuring that we're, we're have regulatory compliance for um, the various different projects that are being undertaken on national forest system lands. Um, be that restoration work, be it active forest or grassland management, range management, um, minerals, and, and I guess I should back up real quick. So the Forest Service is, has a multiple use mandate. Um, and has anybody heard that term before? Just a show of hands, multiple use mandate for the forest. Okay, a couple folks may be vaguely familiar with that. So, you know, the, the idea is that we're supposed to manage to meet, um, you know, a, a, what's termed a multiple use sustained yield across a, the spectrum of resources that are represented across national forest system lands. Um, and so that may be clean water, that may be productive soil. Um, that may be, um, you know, providing a, a, a continuous supply of, of, uh, of wood fiber you know, or, or, or cattle, you know, off of rangelands. Um, and so, so with all of that, you know, inevitably we have, we have benefits and we have impacts, you know. And, and so 
there's a need to understand the scope of those effects as we go about making decisions on the ground. And so um, ultimately, the purpose of a resource specialist like a soil scientist or a hydrologist is to be able to inform decision makers that we call line officers, um, which sounds really yeah, kind of funny. Yeah, exactly. But a like they stand in the line. But yeah. yeah. Um, but to, to basically inform decision makers what the implications are of their decisions. Um, and so what that actually manifests itself as, in turn then, is um, you know a fair amount of time out in the field just trying to understand how landscapes work. Like yeah. Vince said, you know, and and um, and I got into it for the same reason Vince did. I wanted to go spend time out understanding how how you know processes work on the ground. Um, and so you spend some time trying to understand that. You make sure that you are informed on best science. Um, you collect data, and then you you turn that into information. And a lot of that's in the form of environmental compliance documents. Um, under the National Environmental Policy Act, which is another buzzwordy word that maybe folks have heard, maybe they haven't, you know, but uh, NEPA. NEPA, exactly, for short, right? Um, and uh, so, um, the, so beyond that regulatory compliance piece of what, um, what we do, um, there's also generally providing, you know, services to other program areas um, uh, within the, uh, the National Forest Service. So, you know, engineering needs, for example, hydrology, as a hydrologist, I work closely with engineering. You know, we have questions around, like, what kind of design flow should I be using for this crossing, you know? Where do we have risks associated with road infrastructure? Um, you know, what kind of concerns do we have in terms of maintaining flows as it relates to water rights that are out there, et cetera, et cetera. So, um, so there's that, that program, you know, kind of service piece of things. Um, and then another piece of it is, is restoration. Um, and, and depending on you know, what the, the specific national forests you're working on, restoration may be kind of a minor component of what you're doing or it may be a major part of the work you're doing. So I think maybe I'll pause there um, and maybe you fill in the gaps for what I forgot or, or anything sure. to add on top of that. Um, as a soil scientist, we tend to uh, use a bunch of nerdy terms and then people kind of go, oh, soils, you know, it's, it's like the foundation of the earth and, you know, um, which, yeah, without soils, we wouldn't have food or, or the vegetation that we rely on. But I want to kind of step back and, and one of the things that happened in the early 1900s was set-asides and that is, is we had a lot of land grab going on. And so with the um, um, settlement uh, occurring, you, you had a little bit of tragedy of the commons. So we were a little bit over-spirited in our, in our logging and in our grazing. You had the cattle wars versus the sheepers. And so there was no real kind of law of the land as far as like how to moderate any of this stuff. And so initially we had the Forest Service established as a kind of a reserve. Not quite national park, but you know, some place where it's like, okay, we want to set aside this so it's not just private individuals just having the run of the show. Uh, and then it kind of morphed where it, it was like, okay, we had all these kind of degraded lands from the overgrazing at that time because we had you know, livestock numbers in the, in the millions. And, and so we had all these barren hillsides. We also, this uh, coincided with uh, kind of a lot of flooding where a lot of these new settlement towns were getting washed out, like Moab actually was one of those, if anybody's familiar with that. So you had all these mountain ranges who were kind of grazed to nothing, and the storms would hit, and then down comes the sediment, and down comes the floods. So the town people were getting pretty pissed off, and that put pressure on. So anyways, that initial part of the Forest Service was really about allocating resources and moderating resources. and so. Andy was talking about that multiple use sustained yield act that didn't come around until 1960. So we went from this like let's keep the soil on the hill actively kind of like the CCCs in the 1930s if you guys have ever heard of that. That was really active management to restore the hillsides, vegetate them, keep the dirt on the hill. And then, uh, then our agency kind of morphed because we, we had a housing boom coming out of World War II. And so there was this huge, strong push towards providing forest resources, i.e. wood, to 
you know, serve for all the housing. So that's where there was a big shift, but also we had a lot more people getting involved with the forest recreation. So we still had the grazing, we had a lot more timber, and then we had this huge boon, especially for these communities around here, we had mills, like we had seven mills in Missoula in the 70s, and they were churning along. Um, so soils became more and more a part of that management because there was a realization that, well, if we didn't have soil, we may not have the trees that we're trying to provide. And so that sustainability piece really kicked into gear. And so that's kind of why I'm here. In, and it's um, all these policies and these uh, landmark environmental acts that were really around the turn of the 70s, um, the 60s and 70s, that really established that foundation. And so that's what I do to this day is environmental compliance largely. And it's just to moderate our uh, management actions so that we can perpetuate forests um, where we're intending to. In this collecting of data and then trying to turn it into information for compliance reasons and communicating it to stakeholders, what do you think your breakdown of time spent in outside, you both got into this realm because you're interested in the outdoors and or skiing, depending on <laughs> which is also an outdoor activity, um, and versus like inside and at a screen typing words or managing other people. Do you do management? What do you uh, think? What do you um, <laughs> Sorry, lost question. I have to say, those who, who manage other people are very gifted. I'm a nerd. I'm just a data nerd, and I'm, I'm in the office purely almost now, but when I got into this, I wanted to be out in the outdoors, and I was measuring things, and actually, I tried to be Andy first off, and I ran away, and I was like, I'm going terrestrial. So I was working in Yellowstone, and it was freezing. It was snowing in July. We got eight inches of snow in July, and I'm supposed to be in the creek measuring these pebble sizes, I'm just like, no way am I going to be a hydrologist. <laughs> I'm going land lover. So uh, um, I think we start out loving the field, and you know we romance about it all the time. But as we get older, um, you know, we just get shunted into the office because it actually it moves from being a, a data nerd thing to really a social enterprise. And so all. I'll do just one more thing. One of the things that they were concerned with in land management in the 70s when they uh, made some of these landmark laws is that you had to work together with other people. So the timber guy and then the uh, wildlife person and um, hydrologist, all these different disciplines had to come together to formulate what the projects were. And so if you've ever tried to get like 10 friends to choose on one pizza place, it's impossible. Or where to eat or anything. And that's actually what Andy and I do. Yeah. And so it's that social enterprise, which is really unique to these agencies, that, that becomes very interesting. But it all also lowers our data nerdish and makes us much more uh, communication focused and organization focus and working together focused. Kind of looping back in some ways to one of your initial questions, Natalie, was around you know what, what we do, and we've been talking kind of a lot more about it, what, what's happening at the, the Ranger District and National Forest level, just because that's you know where we've really got the rubber hitting the road, and and yet you know Vince really injected you know the the reality for us. At, at multiple levels of the agency, and the fact being that you know, like you get into this one to be a data nerd, and um, and ultimately this, it's about talking to people, you know, um, and and so our you know our respective positions are really about connecting connecting people with the resources they need to do their job. People being you know soil scientists and hydrologists, the resources they need to do their jobs on the ground, um, and and that takes a variety of different, um, I guess. Uh, the, the variety of aspects of that, you know, and some of it's coordinating with the Washington office and interpreting what they're they're telling us we need to be doing. Some of that's, you know, being able then in turn to feed back what we're hearing from the field up to um, another one of those decision makers, you know, at the regional level that we refer to as a regional forester. Again, a total misnomer because we manage a lot more than just forests. Um, 
And you know, some of it's about best science and making sure that that's available in, the term, in, in, in terms of not only just understanding or interpretation, accessibility of that information, but also some of that being in the form of models um, and, uh, you know, and operationalizing that, that information in one way or another. It, it, it kind of varies. Um, so, so wanted to get that out there. Um, and then, you know, there's in, in terms of um, the, the question around, you know, what, what maybe, and again, thinking about, you know, national forest and, and ranger districts kind of scale and what that looks like in terms of amount of time in, in uh, the outdoors versus in the office. Um, at that level, folks are mostly, I mean, it, it varies again, you know, but um, when I was working as a, as a, as a zone and a, and a forest hydrologist, I was spending on the order of two to three days out during field season in the field and then a couple days in, this time of year almost exclusively inside. Um, during the field season, even in my current position, I generally get out once or twice a week, but it changes a little bit more to understanding bigger picture issues and questions at play rather than, you know, than, than doing pebble counts, you know, or, or longitudinal profiles, you know, and, and I do a little bit of that, but but not not nearly as much. So, um, that I feel like there was something else I was going to say to what you you threw out, but maybe it'll come to me in a minute. So, well, so one of the things that I'd advocate for is try a song and don't even, you know, think about like oh okay, look at a summer job. Usually the qualifications aren't that high. For, for technician. And so to me, it, it's, um, it's great to just, you know, see if you like it. Absolutely. See if you like the outdoors, you know, maybe, maybe you've thought about wildlife biology, maybe you've thought of the physical sciences, but we're always looking for technicians. And now we're hiring more than we have in decades. Yeah. And so the only impediment that I'd say is, is when we advertise for hiring, it's clear in September. <laughs> and so knowing how to navigate our awkward sites, because, um, well, we do lowest bid for everything, so <laughs> including our human resource advertisements. Uh, so anyways, I, I think I'd always like to advocate for those early jobs where you're, you're actually out in the elements, you're working out in the woods full time, and, and it's not always great, and you're stuck with the same, you know, two, four, six people, but it's it's definitely something that will stick with you for a long, long time. One of the videos that are is up on the site is with Sienna, and she talks a great deal about navigating USA jobs. But knowing that tech positions are hired in September, um, you could use some of your time in the summer to prepare your profile on USA jobs, and then you can just click the buttons for applying when they when the positions roll around in the fall for the coming summer. Um, does anyone have any questions about what working in, uh, working in, working for, I should say, working for the Forest Service might look like? Otherwise, I'm going to ask some other questions. Sam. Do you guys work with environmental lawyers? Samantha asked if uh, you work with environmental lawyers. Um, we respond to them. <laughs> So yes, we have our own uh, office, uh, let's see, OGC, Office of General Counsel. Yep. And so a lot of what they're doing is environmental law. And basically, uh, we'll come up with our projects, and usually they'll look at our projects and you'll say, well, you didn't listen to us. We said, don't do that, do this. And we'll go, oh, you're right. And, and we'll try and respond to that. But um, yes. Um, yes. Uh, where's the intersection? Right. So they they are in our office mm -hmm. and at the regional level, okay. and so there's um, uh, lawyers at our regional level, and then we also have them at the Washington office level. Yeah. So so maybe tagging on to that, yeah. there's this kind of this intersection with the Department of Justice, right? right. Where you know then then our internal office of general counsel for the forest service and USDA then coordinate with them depending on the scope of the issue at play you know and 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 that those issues being you know largely driven by you know by public accountability um, you know so where do we have um, you know so 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 talking to, like maybe trying to break this down a little bit more um, say there's a, um, a, a grazing management decision that goes out. 
Um, and the public objects to that. They say, well, by one or multiple elements of that. You know, they don't like how things are getting formulated. Um, and so then, in turn, the Forest Service may provide a response to that. Um, and then um, th it could get elevated in turn, and we go into litigation um, with the party. And so then, then in turn, we're coordinating closely, you know, we being either you know, Vince and I at our level or you know, an individual national forest or grassland you know, as to um, how to address those concerns, if, like I say, in this case, as it relates to a grazing management decision. This part of the state, you know, inevitably, it, it tends to be, I shouldn't say inevitably, there's a, frequently it comes around, um, uh, around uh, forest management concerns. Mm -hmm. um, so lots of coordination on that front. For a paralegal, mm -hmm. would there be useful skills? I'm going to say, jump in and say, you definitely have useful skills. But would there be useful skills to um, transition or pivot into Forest Service from there? Hell yeah. yeah. So, um, yeah. And, and one of the things, so I talked about cat herding, different specialties, and try and get, pe you know, try getting 10 to 13 people to show up at a meeting and then do it repeatedly. And you're organizing and coordinating all these people to do an environmental assessment. So you have a set time. You know, you kick off the project and a year and a half, well, it can be years, we'd like to say it's less than a year, you have to have it done. And all those skills that you use as a paralegal for an IDT member, for a writer editor, those are so crucial. And then if you have any specialty tier, say you want to lean into wildlife, uh, biology or anything, you'll use all those skills. Guaranteed. Um, so what are just like your favorite projects that you've worked on? Oh, man. Just to repeat that for the everyone. Favorite projects? That, that's tough, um, but a great question. You know, I've, so, so like Vince said in your gathering as we talk, you know, we're, we're both total geeks, you know, we, we, we love what we do, um, and I, so as I think about the range of different projects I've worked on, um, the ones where I've had to go collect information to really understand a situation that's unique, um, that we don't know how to answer, and then ultimately putting that information together into something to, to make something workable is, uh, is, is what's been the most fulfilling. So a specific example for me that comes to mind is I, I used to work down on the Bitterroot as the, as the forest hydrologist. And while I was there, we had uh, an issue come up where we had a water right on forest. Um, a, a group of, um, of irrigators had a diversion on, on forest lands. And um, that diversion was pulling off a bunch of water, especially late in the season, that was starting to have effect, um, impacts on the water availability for bull trout, which is a, 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 a T &E, or threatened and endangered species under the Endangered Species Act. So we have an additional set of protections that we are you know, required to adhere to associated with maintaining the viability of those species. So, so the fish biologist said, we gotta figure out a way to measure how much water is coming off and then provide something that's easy and easily transferable to these irrigators to understand how, how to regulate themselves essentially like so that they can go in and say here's how much water is in the stream and here's how much we can be pulling off at any given time as we see flows go down through the course of, of the water year. Um, and so that, that took a bunch of iterative measurements out in the field so a lot of discharge measurements literally standing in, in the stream um, to understand you know, how much flow we had at different times of year creating a, uh, a going to throw out a buzzword here, but what's called a stage rating curve to understand that, you know, how much water was in the channel and what that equated to in terms of overall um, basically surface area that was being, you know, uh, occupied by that water. Um, and, and then translating that ultimately to, um, to uh, habitat availability um, and, then, and then providing an, an, an equitable allocation for those irrigators so that they can meet that need. So, and, and I think, you know, the, a thread within that is, and what makes the Forest Service really interesting as compared to say, um, and, and I don't want to diminish by any means like something like the Park Service, I think what sets it, what the distinction is, uh, 
here for me is that instead of having a purely conservation um, based uh, uh, you know mindset, um, we have to meet needs. You know, like people, there there is the, the Forest Service has been charged with with harvesting trees um, to provide sustainable you know uh, uh, fiber. Um, you know, for our, for economies and and like we said, you know, grazing is a big piece of it. You know, and so so inevitably, trying to figure out how to channel what we know about our resources into how to ensure that we 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 minimize or completely avoid adverse effects to those resources we steward is to me what makes it really interesting and more challenging. So that was a great answer because I hope that it showed to everybody how truly interdisciplinary these uh, jobs are. I mean you as a hydrologist aren't doing solely hydrology in the real world and the way this course is structured is none of these items are siloed you can't study a river and ignore biological and geological aspects you can't study soils and ignore geological and biological and hydrological aspects they are all interconnected and there are feedbacks so awesome question thank you and awesome answer and claire um you mentioned when you got hired for the Forest Service, you went to the Upper Peninsula of Michigan. Mm -hmm. When you apply, are you applying to the Forest Service, or are you applying to a regional office, or are you applying to? Great question. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, the, and that's been changing recently. Yeah. Um, and and when I first got into the Forest Service, um, and I worked seasonally prior to even going in as a as a um, uh, in a in a professional series or in a, um, a, uh, uh, in a hydrologist um, position. So at, at that time, it was. Um, an, an individual vacancy. So I was out on USA Jobs, and I, I saw, oh, you know, here's a here's a um, a, a position out there that, that I would qualify for, um, and uh, of course got a hold of the hiring manager and, and asked a little more about it, and then you know went ahead and applied. Um, now we're moving into more of this um, kind of group hiring approach to things, where um, we'll advertise a vacancy across a range of different uh, potential duty stations. Um, and so you can go in when you're, when you're uh, applying and, and select those potential duty stations you might be interested in. Um, but so that you're, you know, in, in that case, yeah, have the ability to potentially look at multiple different places you'd be potentially interested in for that vacancy. So. And, and just to kind of capitalize on that, it, it's a one group and out. Announcement. So instead of seeing like these range of like announcements for all these different locations, we're just piling it into one, w which is also can be scary because you really have to monitor it because it might be only open two weeks. Um, oh my gosh, that's great. We'll start with Mailer, then we'll do Grady, and I know I saw a hand, so we'll get back to the. Go ahead, Mailer. So how long are field technicians? I'm going to repeat it out. How long? Um, how long could you be a field technician, or how long would one of a field technician position last? I think there's a couple of answers. Yeah. So we can accommodate you going to school. So it can be as you know as little as a few months, so that you can, you know, you're done with school. You come work for us, and then you peel off and you go back to school. Uh, there's also um, another great, and, and I'm going to stay away from the acronyms or anything, but basically almost a half year. And then we have still other permanent positions, which is almost three quarters of the year. And so what we're starting to do is we're pushing towards, um, there, there used to be a little bit of classism, so there was seasonal versus permanent. So when you're a permanent employee, you're always guaranteed that job and you get benefits all the way through. And so people would stay in the technician series forever because they wouldn't be able to apply for those permanent positions. Um, but now they're opening that up in flexibility. I'm not completely clear on you know, how many seasonal jobs you can have before you can apply for the permanent but at least it's a stepping stone. So say you want to do permanent or temporary jobs for three or four years to try out different disciplines, and then you can start applying for those more permanent ones. Um, I so, think I went around in circles. No, no, not really. So a, a couple of things to add on to what Vince just said. So he mentioned you know, a seasonal position, 
we're both in permanent positions, so you know, work year round and um, uh, basically, you know, salaried employees, and then we have permanent seasonals, which is what Vince was getting at, you know, where you have um, I, it, it's, uh, I mean, they, they have a specific number of pay periods that you're on, and then you're just off, you know, but, but you still are maintained as a permanent employee, you know, you just have time off during the, the winter. So, those are like Vince was alluding to, a heavily coveted positions. Um, so, um, the other thing that I wanted to add is that, you know, with this conversion, we're starting to take, and again, it's, it's a great time to be working in, in land management agencies, Forest Service, BLM. You know, uh, being being the two big ones, at least in this part of the world, um, because we're we're bringing people on. You know, we've got an opportunity, you know, for for a new generation of folks to, to get going and and uh, you know be be working out there. You can be a field tech for very short, temporary, uh, summer only, or longer um, half years um, on rehires, or you can land a field technician position and hold that for the entirety of your career and that's, you know, if you don't want to ever do office work, that's a thing you can stay with forever, apparently. So I know what I was going to say, and it was just that you have, yeah, so you have, um, you know, with, with these conversion opportunities that we're seeing now, it used to be like, um, the, you basically had to move around. You yeah. know, and, and that was part of the allure, at least for me, you know, you get to go live in these amazing places, you know, and, and steward these great resources. Um, but not everybody has that same kind of flexibility. And so I think what's exciting right now is that you can get into these positions, you know, even seasonally um, in a given location in your hometown or, you know, wherever you want to live, and then potentially work your way through the ranks, which, like I said, did not used to be a possibility. And I might tag on to that, at least for the fire folks. So if you go to work for um, our fire division, and it's not the division, but uh, they are making, uh, they're making benefits available to temporary workers. So if you're doing wildland fire on an engine crew or anything like that, you can access benefits. So that's a new thing, and hopefully that's coming for our other temporary positions. Do you guys know uh, someone named Nate Anderson? Yeah, Nate's great. Yeah, he's my uncle. Really? Oh, all right. <laughs> all right. Yeah, I was just working with his right wife, on. Kay. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, we're, we're actually getting some funding so that we can hire some temporaries to go measure vegetation out in this grazing allotment near the Canadian border where there's a bunch of grizzlies and all sorts of other things, but it's beautiful. It's actually amazing, wetlands and things like that. Oh, interesting question. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I'm going to short form repeat that out for <laughs> this. Uh, are there folks working on uh, studying the contaminants in Ohio right now? So, no would be my initial answer <laughs> because um, we, one, I wouldn't be qualified. That is, that's a different level. So, the, for the most part, and it, it doesn't mean that we don't have people um, who, who don't deal with hazardous materials. Um, so for that specific incident, I don't know of anybody. However, a lot of times we're dealing with post-burn environments, especially in California where we've seen a recent rise, well, we're, we're burning up houses and facilities and things like that. And so you're walking into these hazardous situations and you're trying to size up what are the risks. So that's putting more pressure on us as, as hydrologists and soil scientists to become acquainted with like, okay, what's risky or not, so that we can, um, you know, bring that attention up. Andy, did you have more? And um, so just a quick clarification, was your question specifically around forest service, soil scientists, hydrologists, or more generally the disciplines that, you oh. know. I guess the government involvement yeah. in the forest industry Yeah, right, yes. right. You know what I mean? So that's a national concern because it's a high river, or at least a regional. So I didn't know if maybe the government via the Forest Service would be in some way involved. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah. No, I think. Again, it might be way off what you're here for. <laughs> well, you know, so so like Vince was saying, you know, some of us work in um, in in kind of an emergency. Um, an emergency response context in coordination with FEMA. Vince is actually a coordinator for our post-fire program for the region, right. um, and and so yeah, we have teams that go out and you know look at at you know resource risks post-fire and do that. Um, there are other, um, I believe there are other equivalents with other agencies like like FEMA, for example, you know, um, or the EPA that that would be looking at those types of issues. So yep. Yep. And and I mean, yeah, yeah. So so we're laying this out very much in a federal land management context, you know. But there are also, um, you know, state counterparts to us, um, you know, within like say say Montana DEQ, Montana DNRC, the same over in Idaho, um, you know. And then then also private consulting is is another place where there are a lot of, um, you know, uh, folks in the same disciplines, um, you know. And we there's just really quick for hydrologists, you know, there is. A professional certification process, like like an engineer, um, you know, a PE stamp, and I actually have a, a, a professional hydrologist certification, um, and so you see a lot more of that in the consulting arena, where people are, are using that um, to, uh, to to respond to whatever may be requested, be it from pri- private sector pu- or um, the federal government. Has anybody heard about our Alberton Corns bill that we had in what was that, 1995? Raise your hand if you've heard of it. Train, so same area, okay. same problems with the tracks. So we had our own Ohio happen here outside of Alberton. And we were actually involved in that one because the gas went right on up the hill and killed a bunch of trees. And so we were coordinating in that instance. So it was kind of a jurisdictional thing at that standpoint. But um, yeah, and that was a smaller scale, but if you've seen any of the Missoula articles lately, you know, kind of highlighting some of those after effects, things like that, pretty, pretty bad stuff. I have a two-part question. Um, how intertwined are you with the, with the BLM? And then my second is how often do you test soil in Missoula? Can I repeat that out? How intertwined uh, is Forest Service with the BLM and how often is soil tested in Missoula? Andy, do we wear brown? <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes, right? So, yeah. So, so the BLM gets to wear brown uniforms. We get to wear green ones. I don't have any. Uh, but the funny thing is, is uh, we were just talking about what are our BLM counterparts doing. And so working with them. And so there's this kind of all lands recognition uh, about we're needing to work together because we're facing larger issues. You know, we have these big wildfires that go, and they don't stop at boundaries. Uh, we're, we have climate change that we're starting to think of. Andy deals with water. Water doesn't start stop at boundaries either. Um, so I'll do the overview. Andy, do you want to bring out kind of some of the coalitions we have with the BLM? Um, yeah, it's, it's sort of tough to give you anything but a really synoptic look. But yes, I mean, we do coordinate with, with the BLM here, here just in the northern region, um, you know, I, I was actually just meeting with my counterpart in the BLM last week. Uh, and, you know, we explore opportunities around restoration. Um, we, we try to, in general, talk about, you know, where we have commonalities um, and uh, in, in, as it relates to, you know, effects on the ground and then what kind of resources we're providing to our, to our specialists. You know, from a, from a funding perspective, we have multiple different streams of money that are explicitly saying, we want you to be coordinating with the Department of the Interior. Um, so, so that, I guess, the, the amount of um, uh, coordination is, it, it, I think we've, we've been coordinating consistently over time, but I think it's increasing. Okay. Testing in Missoula. So we talked about a little bit of the silos with jurisdiction. And so Andy and I work for the Forest Service, so really everything that we work towards is towards Forest Service kind of area management. So there's a jurisdictional boundary. It doesn't mean that we don't coordinate with the counties. It's just we'll, uh, we'll make recommendations or, or share data that the counties can use. Uh, so most of the soil testing 
that the counties are doing are, are typically, we're, we're not part of that. But we're always interested in sharing those findings towards whatever larger goal. Do you guys have employees that were in FFA? Employees oh, that were in interesting. FFA? Future Farmers of America. Um, I don't know offhand, but I would highly, highly encourage you know participation in that because we are USDA, yeah. and so any that just looks great on a resume. Um, and if we get some more, if you're looking at wrapping up, I wanted to be uh, doing a unabashed appeal for workers. So yeah, do it. Okay. Um, so first of all. Um, one of the things, like, I like my time and tenure in the Forest Service, but I want to make a plug for physical science in general. And so there's a couple of resources you have here. I think I had mentioned about that grazing allotment that we're going to University of Montana for and saying, hey, we're looking for workers. Because a lot of times it's hard for us to hire. Like, it was easier 20 years ago to hire, we would just say, oh, you're enrolled at University of Montana, we'll sign you up, away we go. Well, that got um, changed. So we're trying to loosen things up, but we're not quite there yet. But we also love partnering with other organizations. And so I wanted to call out Emma, which is under the Carol O'Connor Rocky Mountain Center of the West. Um, no. no, I think she's housed somewhere else. Because she's over they're, by the Lomason Center. Yeah, yeah. Lomason yeah. Center. So these well, jobs get advertised at the university. I have no idea where, but <laughs> <laughs> they're there. And so there's all these departments in the university that are always looking for seasonal workers and help. And a lot of those may be tied in to work with us. And so that, to me, is a, the easiest route to get some field experience and, and tenure and uh, for work in the physical sciences or biological sciences. Um, so I wanted to push that, that piece. And the other piece that I wanted to call out too, though, is um, we're doing recent grad uh, hiring. So that is, as soon as you graduate, within, what is it, a year? Yeah, I think within so. a year, you can actually apply for permanent positions. Um, I that that that's an incredible opportunity. So just wanted to throw that out there if you're looking, um, and then always feel free to reach out to us. We do have a person who coordinates hiring, and so I can provide the name and email of her contact to Natalie to share with you. But also, Andy and I are ambassadors, so we're always willing to push the sciences, too. Go ahead, Samantha. Are tech jobs only outside? Because I don't want to work outside. No. Okay. We're going no, we, hiring for, like, in office jobs? We need everything. Yeah. And, and yeah, the office skills. And that's another thing. Is, is So we talk about data nerdy and, and that kind of thing. So one of the things that I notice is we, in general, are really lacking writing skills and communication skills. So I'm constantly learning because my skills go bad. You know, think of like writing, you know, quick synopsis on, on email or, or now it's just the instant messages. That communication and being able to wrap up things concisely is a huge skill that we're always working on bettering. Yeah. So I will just say this to you all where maybe 10% of you are interested in a major in the earth sciences. Some of you might be interested in nature, but not want to work as a naturalist. That might be a position, I don't know. You know what I mean? A scientist working stuff outside. But maybe you like nature, and you like the outdoors, and you also like writing, or you also like doing mathematics, or you're really good at coordinating or scheduling. This is a place where all of those skills are embraced within the subset of your mandate is conserving and distributing uh, the lands for the people, which is, uh, which is not un to undersell what is your interest and what is your skill set. An agency like the Forest Service is a really great place to put those things together. Are there any last questions? Oh, Emma. If you Other Emma. 
are interested in like field work and more of the science aspect is like writing skills and communication skills like degree wise something you'll look at when hiring as well absolutely mm -hmm. yeah definitely yep yeah so so even that field work you know which which in a lot of cases may be literally every day out you know in the elements you know doing you know repetitive tasks or you um you know or moving around and maybe not doing repetitive tasks regardless um, that all has to be communicated, and and so yes, being able to, to write and uh, and and explain what you're doing is is absolutely essential for sure. Yeah. Great question. Any other? We'll just keep going. Any other questions? Thank you so 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 much for coming and sharing your time and your expertise. Um, I have also been pigeonholed in a career um, bouncing around place to place, and while I can talk about what you all do, um, it is so much more valuable to get to hear about what you actually do from the people who are doing that work. So it is really appreciated. Uh, can everyone give a hand?